weekend is the very last weekend in the season of Epiphany in the Christian calendar. And uh, this coming Wednesday now is Ash Wednesday. We begin the season of Lent or preparation for Easter. And uh, this leads up to the commemoration of Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. The highlight of the Christian calendar in so many ways. Now there are debates go on between Christmas and Easter as which is the highlight on the one hand. Without Easter, we would not have any hope of eternal life. But if God did not become human and take into himself our humanity, we wouldn't have that either. So it's all one part of the overall marvelous plan of God where we realize that all our life God has been in, is, and will continue to be so, so good. Epiphany began several weeks ago uh, with the story of Jesus' baptism in Mark 1, a most amazing event. As the Son of God, the human being, Jesus Christ, however, the Son of Man, came and was baptized and demonstrated for all of us the fact that he was taking, has taken on humanity and he is, for all of humanity, giving his life and coming back to resurrection so that we could as well and set that example for all of us. But it ends an even higher note with the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And that's what we dis uh, will be discussing today. Today is known as Trans Transfiguration Sunday. And so the title of the message is Lessons from the Transfiguration, which uh, I'm known for my really catchy, uh, ingenious titles, and that's one of them. <laughs> you know. um, but you know, Often we, we read about and we know about these different major events in the life of Jesus, which is in the life of all of us, because without it, where would we be? And we can read over them. So we're going to see that some of the lessons that we see today, they seem obvious. They're in all the Gospels, and we've, we understand them, and they, they seem obvious but others might be downright confusing. And because of that, maybe God has a message for you and me from all of this that is something we haven't thought of before. So we're going to begin, uh, and I'm going to be using uh, the Gospel of Mark, that version, Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. It's in all four Gospels, but Mark seems to <clears throat> go into more detail that might be helpful for us today. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, I'm using the New Revised Standard Version today. But, you know, the NIV is very close, and uh, King James, many of the others are as well. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 10, we'll read it first. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. That's what they call in advertising, whiter than white. You know, I mean, just overwhelming. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. I think you can understand that. Some people, when you get panicky, you just sees, don't know what to do. Some people, when you're really under stress, they talk. You may have noticed that. All of a sudden, a stressful thing, and, and somehow you you got to say something, and so on. Peter was one of those. We know from reading the whole Gospels, Peter always had something to say. No matter what the situation was, that's how he responded. We sometimes maybe uh, look down on him for that, but that's, Peter was Peter, you know. 
He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Story of the Transfiguration. It's in all four Gospels, but we're looking at it from Mark's perspective. And Mark begins in verse 2 with six days later. So let's go back and get the context of what happened before Jesus took them up on the mountain. So back in Mark chapter 8, we'll we'll begin verse uh, 27 because it's something extremely important for us to see the clarity and the importance of what happened afterwards. Mark 8, 27, and we'll read down to verse 33. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man uh, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter always had something to say. And in this case, maybe Jesus didn't understand what messiahs were supposed to do. Jesus was humble, okay? So he, he took him aside. Now, wait a minute. You can't say that. That's, that can't happen. You're the Messiah. I just told you. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You kind of wonder, why did he look at his disciples? He looks at at all of them and say, I'm telling you, but it's for all of you as well. I'm sure they thought the same thing. That's why I'm going to die and three days rise from the dead and so on. The Messiah doesn't do that. The Messiah was supposed to restore the greatness of Israel. And that question was on their mind even after he was resurrected. Let's drop down to chapter 9 and verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now, sometimes we stop and we read that, or people do, and they think, oh, and that was even uh, a concern back then. So some of them are going to live all the way until Jesus comes again. No. We go on to verse 2, and that tells us what happens. Six days later, he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and he was transfigured. They saw him in uh, God in his glory. <clears throat> and no wonder they were terrified. But what we want to do right now is we want to analyze the text a little bit. One thing that's interesting in, in the way all four gospel writers bring this is you will see four different groupings of threes. Have you noticed that? Four groupings of three. First of all, we've got the three glorified ones. We've got Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And here, all of a sudden, they see there's Jesus, and he's talking with Moses and Elijah. The first question you always ask is, well, how did they know who they were? You know, how would they know what Moses and Elijah looked like? They didn't have any portraits or paintings or anything like that of them. So Jesus must have called them by name. Oh, okay. So, and Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Christ represents the fulfillment of the old covenant, the law and the prophets, and is the initiator of the new covenant. 
So on the one hand, they were seeing here very clearly as, as they look back on it, and we can see today that the baton was being passed. And Moses and Elijah, they were talking to Jesus about what he was going to do and so on. But the baton was being passed from the old covenant and it was coming to an end and the new covenant was beginning. But I think there's something else that's interesting here. Moses and Elijah were the only two exceptions in history up to that point. Because otherwise, no one could look upon God and live. They even said, you've, ne you've neither seen his face nor heard his voice. But two exceptions. Moses asked God, show me your face. And God said, oh, you can't see that, you can't live. But I'll stick you in the crevice of a rock back here in the cave, hold my hand over you, and I'll walk by and I'll let you see my back. Moses comes down from the mountain and he's glowing in everything. He had to cover his face because it was so, so white. Again, whiter than white and so on. Elijah's really down and out. And he wants to hear from God, and he says, okay, just listen. We'll stick you back in the cave and listen. And first he hears the thunder, and then he hears the earthquake and all that, and God wasn't there. And then he hears just a tiny whisper and scares the daylights out of him because he was hearing the voice of God, and he did not die. And now those two, the disciples... Peter, James, and John see them, but they see Jesus in all the glory of God. Far beyond what Moses was able to see. Far beyond uh, what uh, Elijah was able to hear. And, um, yeah. So we come to the next threesome. The disciples. Peter, James, and John. The lead apostles initially who would lead Christ's church, they look on. Now, it was important for you and for me and for the people back then that they were there for reasons that we don't necessarily always think of. Why did God, why did Jesus take them up there? Why, did the, the, why was the transformation, transfiguration even necessary? Well, back in Deuteronomy, the law stated that something had to be in place for you to even believe someone. Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense that they have command, committed. And as it turned out, any other thing, if they're, they're saying, this happened, you need more than one witness. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so Jesus takes three witnesses. After he, he Peter says, you're the Messiah. Guys, come with me, you three, you're the leaders. They see God in his glory. They see Jesus, the Messiah. They see Moses and Elijah talking about that. They can go back down. And they can witness what has happened. But he said, don't say a thing about this until the Son of Man is resurrected from the dead. And of course, obviously, they weren't going to say anything about it because they were still trying to figure out what in the world was he talking about this time? He was always saying stuff that didn't make sense then. But looking back, it made all the sense in the world. The whole Old Testament all of a sudden made sense. So, you had the three witnesses, Peter, James, and John. Then we have the next threesome, Jesus, the voice, and the cloud. Mark 9, uh, 1, 9 through 11, in those days, uh, uh, yeah, then we go back to Mark 9. This, this refers them back to uh, Mark 1, verse 9. Boy, if I could count and talk and, and turn the lights on at the same time, I would really be able to earn a lot more money. Mark 1, 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And just as he was coming out of the water, this is what we looked at at the beginning of Epiphany, baptism of Jesus. As he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And the voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved with you, I am well pleased. Father, Son, Spirit. The voice from heaven coming out of the cloud, the Spirit descending, and the Son right there, the beloved Son. So, the same thing happens again. That's confirmed. So, you've got the three holy ones, if you might call that, Jesus, Moses, and, and Elijah. You've got the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. You've got the Trinity, Jesus, the voice, and the cloud. But three dwellings? What's with that? Why is that even mentioned? They've all four uh, gospel writers mentioned. Peter makes this crazy comment. He didn't even know what he was talking about. I'm going to make three dwellings. They kind of, nobody pays attention and they take them, you know. This is my son. Listen to him. What was all that about? Let's read this again. Going back to verse 2 of Mark 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white so, uh, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's a good thing, it, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then it says, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Peter, the kind of guy that always has to blurt out something, scared spitless, as the others were. And so he says something. Now, in the Passion Translation, it's a more... Um, uh, freer translation, kind of like the message. This is how they word it. Peter blurted out, good teacher, this is so amazing to see the three of you together. Why don't we stay here and set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and then in parentheses, for all the disciples were in total fear, and Peter didn't have a clue what to say. Something just came out. That's even more of a reason. Why in the world would the Holy Spirit even inspire that? He's just blurting out nonsense. He didn't build any dwellings. Luke, in his uh, uh, rendition of, of the Transfiguration, he words it this way. Give us a little insight. Now, Peter and his companions were weighted down, weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Now, I've experienced that. Did I say that? Yeah, you did. I, I never said that. not knowing what he said. So Peter didn't have a clue, like it says. Well, then why, the three, why mention these dwellings? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire this to be included in Scripture, in all the Gospel accounts? Is there something about these dwellings we might be missing? Let's look at a few Scriptures and get an idea what it might really be about. John chapter 14, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he's been talking to his disciples, encouraging them, and in verses 15 through 17, this is what we read. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, 
because he abides or dwells or lives within with you and will be he will be in you he lives or he dwells or he abides with you and he will be in you then we go on to chapter 17 he's still it's still the night in which he was betrayed and in verse 20 we read this he's now praying talking to the father I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be, uh, uh, be, all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you in me that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Then later on in 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have, which you have from God, that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So, I guess now we understand. The three disciples didn't build any dwellings that day. Unbeknown to them, they were to be the dwellings in which Christ would present, be present in the world after his ascension. And they would be, along with all the others, coming all the way down to now, including you and me, the ones, the dwellings of God in our world today. They're reaching out to those who do not yet know him. Three dwellings that didn't even know they were dwellings. Why did he blurt that out? Because we needed to understand what would be happen later on as we read the scriptures. We are the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Christ is living in us. Christ in you. Christ in me. The hope of glory for all. So, in conclusion, a few insights. Number one, I got three. The kingdom of God is all about Jesus. So I went, all was done, everything was gone, only Jesus was there. He takes them back down the mountain and says, let's get on with it now. And only later on could they understand that, and once they did, their life was all about Jesus. He's the sole focus. The entire Bible is about Jesus. Number two, as overwhelming as the transfiguration was, they couldn't grasp the meaning until after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, ascension to heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So in spite of how, how all that they saw, that still certain things just never clicked until something else happened. Might you be in that kind of a situation? Are there certain things that just don't seem to make sense to you because there are other insights the Holy Spirit needs to give you at a later time. I think all of us, we, we walk the Christian walk, but there is so much still we don't understand. That's why we read we walk by faith and not by sight. And we wait and let the Spirit guide us and lead us. The Spirit will lead us into all truth. That means we don't have it all right now, but we're learning. And that's what the disciples needed to learn as well. And thirdly, what's important as we read this is not what we do for Jesus, but whether we listen to him and do what he says. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Over in Luke 11, um, an incident happened in verse 27. We read, while he, Jesus, was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to them, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. We follow Jesus 
We learn from Jesus. We listen to Jesus. And it all is there so we can learn to obey him, to listen and follow and do what he says and become, through the help of the Spirit, a reflection of Jesus Christ in our world around us. One last verse. We've got to bring this to a, come back to the beginning. Second Peter chapter 1. We'll conclude with Second Peter 1, verses 16 through 19. Peter, writing to Christians who were in the process of be, uh, expecting persecution, he reminded them of this in verse 16 of Second Peter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. They didn't just see Jesus when he was resurrected as a human being. They were allowed to see God in his glory. And then it happened again later on when the apostle John was Uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos and and, uh, Jesus revealed himself to him again in that way in in Revelation chapter 1. How did he know? Because he'd seen it before. We We have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed, just like the Bible said it needed to be be believable. Three witnesses. And then Peter says this, to them, but written for us as well. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Jesus, God's beloved son, may we always listen to him. Let us pray. Our Father, we... uh, We thank you again for your word and we thank you so much for the different areas of the scripture that show us so clearly who you are and what your plan and purpose is and show us who Jesus Christ is, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our King, the coming King of kings and Lord of lords, but our high priest as well. Jesus is everything for us because Jesus is God. We ask that you would help us as we go from this place today that we would remember this more clearly, that we would look for your leading and guidance and listen to the word that comes to us from you through, your, through Scripture, through the guidance of your Spirit, and in any other way such as being together and encouraging one another. Thank you for your love for us all. May you be honored by our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.